So welcome everybody to the VEGU 2021 great debate on research software. On behalf of the conveners, I welcome you and our debaters to the first time the discussion on how we can improve research software in the geosciences takes the biggest stage the EGU has to offer. We thank the EGU team and our partners for the support, the Earth and Space Science Informatics Division, our co-sponsor, the American Geophysical Union, and the ESIP Data Help Desk. The Virtual Data Help Desk at EGU lets you engage with data and software experts on your questions on research data and research software. Check out the tutorials at bit.ly slash data help EGU21. You can also ask questions via the web form or on Twitter using the hashtag data help desk. During the next 90 minutes, we will talk about everything related to creation, use and sharing of research software across all geoscience research disciplines. We will start by hearing short introduction statements by our debaters before continuing to answer and debate your questions. Already now, I want to point out that we hope this debate will be a starter of many discussions, and there are multiple options to stay engaged after this event. You can find them all on the Great Debates website, which you can find in the chat, or at bit.ly slash VEGU21 minus debate. Now let me briefly introduce the team behind the debate and the debaters. My name is Daniel Nuss, and I'm with the University of Münster. The co-conveners are Niels Drost from the Netherlands eScience Center, David Topping from the University of Manchester, and Leslie Weiborn from the Australian National University. Our moderator today is Daniel Katz. Dan is an expert in research software himself, and we are very happy to have him guide us through the discussion towards the really hard questions. He is chief scientist at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications in the US and research associate professor at the University of Illinois Urbana campaign. He's also founding editor of the Journal of Open Source Software and an active member of the research software community, not the least known for his work on software citation and software sustainability. Before we turn to our debaters, some brief announcements. Please use the Zoom Q&A feature to ask your questions and help us find the most interesting questions by using the voting buttons. Please note that participants joining us via the live stream on the VEGU website using Vimeo won't be able to ask questions directly, but we will monitor the chat there and try to transfer questions to Zoom. Please understand there is a delay in the stream and you won't be able to vote on questions or participate in polls. So please join the, the Zoom webinar if you can. If you're on Twitter, uh, use the event hashtags VEGU21, hashtag GDB3. And now, please meet our debaters. Karina Haupt is head of the Software Engineering Group in the Intelligent and Distributed Systems Department of the Institute for Software Technology of the German Aerospace Center, DLR. Karina and her team aim to support domain scientists by creating high quality software for their day to day problems. Karina is an active member of the German research software engineers community and conducts her own research in scientific software, open source, and knowledge and data management. Kim Saradell is the manager of the Computational Sciences Group at the Earth Sciences Department in the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Kim's group guides scientists around the technical challenges in using high performance computing. He is responsible for the operation of model runs such as Monarch and the Calliope Air Quality System and contributes to the HPC community on an international strategic level as a teacher, as well as in making HPC software stacks more efficient. Patrick Sannon is a computational mathematician and scientific software developer in the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Group in the Institute of Geophysics at ETH Zurich. Patrick pursues cross-disciplinary research, combining applied mathematics, computational geometry, parallel algorithms, and physical simulation. His interests lead to diverse activities, for example, in electroacoustic and computer music, software for large parallel geodynamic simulations, or scientific application testing. Paul Foot is an assistant professor at the Water Resources Engineering Department of Delft University of Technology. Rolf is an advocate for open science and principal investigator on the eWater Cycle project, where the team is building a platform that makes computational experiments easier for hydrologists and offers easy access to models made by other hydrologists, as well as to commonly used input data sources through open standards and containers. His interests also include geoscientific science communication, for example, using games. And last but not least, Susanne Bauter 
She's newly appointed professor in technologics and geodynamics at RWTH Aachen University, where she teaches and researches in deformation processes from outcrop to plate scale. Susanne's tools are numerical finite element and analog sandbox techniques. Before coming to Aachen, she worked for the Geological Survey of Norway. Susanne also was program committee chair for EGU for the 2018, 19, and 2020 General Assemblies and served as president for the Tectonics and Structural Geology Division from 2013 to 2017. Please do check out the detailed speaker profiles on our website and take a look at the excellent work. I apologize to the speakers for not including much of their great outputs because they were too numerous or too hard to pronounce. Karina, Tim, Kim, Patrick, Rolf, and Susanne, thank you very much for joining us today. Then let's get started with the debate. Okay, great. So we're going to start with some brief uh, opening statements uh, from each of the panelists, about two minutes, and we'll start with Karina. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, as an open source enthusiast, I want to state um, shortly how um, uh, research software um, comes together quite naturally, in my opinion, with open source and how important the community is. Um, so today, research questions get more and more complex, which we try to answer. And we are able to do this because we um, have existing knowledge, which we can base it on, and we have um, hardware and uh, computer uh, science and, and, and hardware and everything, which helps us to answer our question. But there's one potential um, which we don't use as much as we could, and that's especially existing software. So while a lot of research all researchers already work with open source um, software, especially general tools which support them, which help them write uh, scripts to analyze their data and stuff, um, there's a lot of research software out there which is not publicly available for others. A lot of people think it's only them having this problem or um, that others couldn't use the software they are working on and it's not worth sharing it. But in my opinion, this is much more of not the case than it is. Because um, we, I work at the German Aerospace Center and we have faced a lot of domains. It's from aerospace, space transportation um, and traffic. And we face the same type of problems in a lot of different places. And we are creating communities to bring these people closer together. And uh, they figure out they have faced the same issues and they implement it again and again. And I think we have to change this by opening up the source code, by opening up the research code and make it available for this. Um, not only that others can reuse it, but they can also support and maintain it uh, together with you so that we can create small communities not about domains, but um, around the same kind of issues they have. And this worked really well for the HPC uh, domain, for example, there we have this really neatly that a lot of domains are stepping into it and coming together. And I think there's a lot of more potential we can step into. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, next will be Kim. Thank you, Dan. So first of all, thank you for inviting me and, and the, the, the opportunity to participate. My, my my introduction would be that uh, to, to understand, to, to, to start saying how can the research software become a first class output uh, across all the digital sciences and how we can credit, uh, we can we can credit be given to its authors and contributors. So for the first for the first question, I would say that that it, it would be important to analyze and, and import methodologies, tools and best practices from the, 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 would say, traditional software development to, to research scientists. Historically, research science, uh, science software has been driven by, 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 science, by domain scientists, which I think the, the ultimate goal, totally understanding, is the, is the science and the results to, to that, that they are working on. And perhaps taking a little bit less care of the framework and the practices, the software practices that they, they are they are applying. So, so I think it's time, and, and we are on the road, but there's a lot of to do, to, to add research engineers in the, in, in, the, in the workflow to deploy this kind of, of solutions. And as solutions, I'm thinking, obviously, on control version systems, on practices like the test, test driven development, like unique testing or integration test, or continuous integration and continuous deployment, deployment to for example, to always validate what the, the output of the software that is produced or even the performance itself of, of the software. 
And, and, and when, when we want to, to deploy this kind of practices, I think it's really important to put a lot of, 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 of pressure to have clear directions from a management or for a head of the group that decides to, to put these working practices and obviously lots of training and, and documentation. And, and in the, the question of the, of the credit, I, I think it's really important to add research engineers to scientific papers co-authors. So this, this section that is appearing in the last years that, that explain in the papers who has done what, I think it's really important. And having these names on the research uh, engineers in, in these papers is really important for their career. So we tend to think that it's important only for scientists, but if, if a research engineer wants to move from an institution to other, it's a way of showing what he has or she has been done in, in the previous career. So thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, next, we'll have Patrick. Yeah, thank you all for coming and thanks for having me. Um, so my background is applied mathematics. Um, I'm a postdoc working on geodynamics at the moment. Um, and I work with parallel software, including the Petsy library. So um, what I'd like to use my introductory time to do is to bring up the uh, questions about how we are going to sort of teach researchers more about software um, when we have the opportunity to do so. So this is really important in the sense that if we believe that computation is the third pillar of science, which I think has some validity to it beyond just marketing HPC, um, we have to take this opportunity to teach people at a lower level um, the tools that they're going to be using. So even a few weeks um, of training in things like how Unix actually works, how lower level languages like C work, how computers work, um, I think gives some intuition to people um, to follow up on what Kim said, understanding how things like version control work, um, having at least seen that once on a fundamental level um, could be a valuable opportunity. And I'm wondering if the community feels that um, they would have benefited from learning these things up front. Um, I think that to follow up on something that Karina said, I think that the education of researchers who are going to be using software does have to include um, some covering of the ethics involved here. The scientific aims and the aims of open source software are quite aligned. Things like reproducibility, um, openness, uh, assumptions of good faith of a community are very well aligned between these two communities. And I think we need to double down and emphasize in those things um, in training our researchers. Um, and finally, I'd like to hear discussion on maybe a more practical level about um, what tools we're going to be using to do teaching. Um, there's been a lot of movement towards um, things like Python, towards things like Julia, um, perhaps away from things like MATLAB. Um, these are things I'm happy about, but um, I can see there being a debate about whether that's um, become a useful thing on the, on the front lines in a practical sense. I'm interested to hear about that. Um, and finally, uh, during this discussion, I'm interested to hear uh, what people think about how we can be more intelligent uh, and how we're going to use our very limited time and energy. Um, as Karina was pointing out, we need to reuse things. Um, and I think we should really be focusing on how we can be smart about realizing that scientists are a very particular cast, class of software user. Um, they're people who, for instance, would actually love to read a very good um, set of documentation. Um, they're people who often, maybe the typical case is to need to modify the code you're using in some way. The typical case is to need to dissect how it works. Um, so you really can report on your, in your research. And this is perhaps creates a tension with a lot of the tools that exist for um, software engineering at large, which is aimed towards a much broader and perhaps different class of users. Um, so I look forward to the discussion. And thanks again. Great, thank you. Uh, the fourth panelist is Rolf. Thank you. Um, I like to use these two minutes to say that any effort aimed at teaching scientists to write better code is probably wasted. And also like to say that the best research software engineer and also the best research software is invisible to scientists. Because scientists should focus on their science and the questions they want to answer. And research software is something that facilitates that. And I like to compare developing research software by research software engineers and scientists alike to road construction. And the metaphor breaks down at some point, but it serves me slightly, I think, for this panel discussion where a scientist just wants to go from A to B. And if there's no road, they'll find their own path. And then they'll report on the path that they found and then once they're at point B, they want the entire community to come there and then move to a point C. 
But to get the community to that point, you could do either show them the little path, but it's not an efficient path. I mean, I'm also in hardware and hardware design and this stuff is uh, full of duct tape and it's not the kind of stuff that you wanna advertise people to use. What you want is a research software engineer that then builds a highway to go from point A to B so that the entire community can go there. But don't let the scientists build that highway because if there's anything they're not good at, it's that. They're good at pathfinding. Of course, the scientist needs to inform the research software engineer, have a good discussion on where the highway actually needs to go. But the scientist also needs to shut up when the research software engineer says, this is the best way to build a highway. And I do think that we need to be able to understand each other's language, but we need to be very careful that we don't demand of the other to become each other. Because only then can we supplement each other if we're not the same. All right, so it's, uh, it's interesting to see that we have some different views about uh, how scientists should have expertise in software or, or shouldn't. Um, We'll come back to that. Uh, so we'll, we'll end with the opening statement from Susan, and then, uh, then we'll, we'll move on to the next piece. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I'm actually really loving the debate that's already taking place. Um, in, in, in a way, I, I would not always see such a distinction between scientists and um, software, um, research, research software engineers, um, because many of the scientists are also developing the software and doesn't make them total specialists. But, um, so, so the, the research software comes in many flavors and sizes. Huh? Um, we all ensure that our software passes technical tests and benchmarks, um, but we don't really have a demand on user friendliness of the software, or let alone a, a set of um, criteria by which to judge the, the ease of use of a software, or related to this where we could find the software or know the conditions of, of access to the software. So my view is that similar to research data and digital tools, um, such as software, um, should be fair. This should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And I, a statement like this assumes that software is open. And my view is that academic software should be open. But when I say that my own software is not open, um, it's not user-friendly, um, and our experiments with sharing show that we did not have the time for the expected user support. So the ideal is clear, but there are pragmatic reasons why this doesn't happen. So who's responsible for assuring that a software can be found and uh, used and that it can communicate with other software and that users know how to use it? Research, researchers themselves, we often don't, we simply do not have the time. And the solution could be community software um, as this shares the work. But at the same time, I think there should always be room for new software for, for skill development, but also to give a chance to, to new approaches that might otherwise not appear when the community is going in, in one direction. So software is a tool that needs time, not, not just only for maintenance, but for adaptation to user needs and demands and for training. So I'm re really looking forward to the debate. Many thanks. All right, thank you. Um, so at, at this point, we will uh, try a poll of the audience to see what everybody out there thinks about research software. And then we'll, we'll go on and have some, some more uh, discussion between the panelists, and look at some questions. Um, all right, so we have quite a mix of people, uh, professor, postdoc, students, RSEs, research staff. Um, Actually, a mix of people developing software as well. With most people not developing so much, but lots of people sharing their software, almost half, which is all the time, and three quarters, at least some of the time, which is great. Embarrassment about low quality is the main reason people don't share their software, which I think no one should be embarrassed by the quality because everybody's software isn't very good. Not much of a mandate for sharing software. Documentation is seen as the main problem, but most people are reusing other people's software, which I think makes sense because it's almost impossible not to these days. And good to see lots of citation uh, and a fair amount of other things. And almost nobody is not recognizing the software, which is great. So, okay, so let's, um, let's get back to the panel. Um, so the, the intent was that we would spend a bit of time uh, initially looking at problems that we have 
and then have another poll and then talk about some solutions to those problems. Um, and so just looking at some questions that we've had from the audience, um, maybe we'll start with the first one that came in, which is um, that software engineers are much better at writing software than scientists, but most research institutes don't provide software engineers to support scientists and the software scientists have to do the, the job of writing software themselves. Um, how can we address that? Does anybody want to, to say anything about that? Yeah, Rolf. Um, I want to have two points on that, I guess. I think we should make a distinction in here between the um, software that you use to come to a scientific conclusion and that and the software that you want others to use to build upon because these are two very different things uh, so bad that you use to come to a scientific conclusion that that gives graphs or outputs that gives insight into new into uh, geoscientific processes etc is not necessarily meant to be built upon by others um, it, if you recognize that you want others to build on your software for example, if you make an hydrological model in, in my field, then there should be an onus on the developer to make it such that others can build upon it. But if it's just an analysis, I don't think you have to. If you're in a field where everybody is using each other's, is building on each other's software, not only each other's knowledge, um, and you don't have a software engineer close at hand, then you should make sure that that changes and that is very difficult depending on the position in academia you're in but i think it should be normal to include budget for software engineers in a uh, science proposal that's very heavy on computational science okay patrick i think it's very important as Ralph said to try and distinguish between yeah, the types of, of software that are required. And I think that uh, the assumption that software engineers are, are good at writing software or better at writing software is true in a certain sense, but there's also the problem that, the, that, I've, that I feel like I've seen several times is that the type of software that is enjoyable or, in, or inspiring for software engineers and RSEs even to write is not necessarily the software that the users need or, or want. Um, and so I think that like from the, perspective of someone who's a developer or an RSE looking at the at the users, at the scientists, um, often people who are like graduate students who are probably have only been programming for a few years maybe, um, they need to understand that um, writing things in a way that, that can be modified or at least can be understood is incredibly valuable um, to these people and that solving things in a clever way, writing things that are very efficient is kind of what software engineers and RSEs often think that there is their mandate. And if you have a specific application that warrants that, that's true. But I think it's unrecognized enough as it should be that in many applications, something that is um, understandable by the user or simpler, even if it is less efficient, um, can actually be what they need and want, at least in the initial iteration of a project, which to be honest is often the only iteration of a project. Many projects don't survive the five years maybe, let's say, that really warrants high performance implementation of something. So. I think that, yeah, it's good that we're trying to define different classes of software that um, RSEs or engineers are delivering, because if they don't get that right at the beginning, the project can be doomed um, and their time can be wasted. Everyone's time can be wasted. Okay, uh, Suzanne. I think these are very valid points. It partly points to, to communication between um, two groups that are, I think they're partly being put separate, but I, I would not like them to be put separate actually, because I, I can see the big overlap. I mean, there, there's there's definitely a difference in, in rigor of software and in um, flavor of software. Um, but I would not like to make a distinction between, you know, a full-blown software that we use to, that is developed with research software engineers and that we use to test things versus what, what Rolf was saying, a tool that we just use for, for analysis. Because I think in both cases, um, they should be treated the same in the sense that they should be open because that will allow us to, to verify and to reproduce and, and for others to, it's the, it's the exact requirement. You know, we, we should always be able to, 
to, to, to check each other, to reproduce what someone has been done. Um, and, and I would treat actually any tool, whether it's a software or, or some other um, analysis or method in, in the same way. And we, we need to make sure that, that we are always reproducible. Okay, so uh, Karina. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I have to agree. So it's always about the context you develop your uh, software for, but the context can change over time. So I agree with Suzanne that you can't separately completely because often software it starts at one point at something like a proof of concept from perhaps a PhD student or something, and then it evolves over time and it comes bigger and bigger and people realize, okay, this is something a lot of other people might want to use and it needs to be written in a better way. So I think it's hard to distinguish um, at the very beginning, but it's, um, you it's something you have to reiterate time over time again, what is the context and what is the target um, of my software? What do I want with it? Is it just to, to show? And in all these cases, it needs to be open, in my opinion, it needs to be available to others, but obviously it needs um, different aspects regarding the quality of it. And um, so this has to increase over time if it gets mainly used. If it's not getting used, you don't have to increase the time. This is something I want to also talk about to pull really quickly because it's stated that it's a typical result that people are afraid to share their code because of bad quality. And I think if you write to it what the purpose of your co uh, code is, then you don't need to be afraid so much because if you say this is just a proof of concept or this is just an analysis I did quickly for this, this paper or something, then nobody expects too much. But if you say, okay, now a lot of some, several people are using it in my institute or something, then the expectation goes up and you might also have an idea okay what you need to to do next there's also guidelines um what i developed with together with friends uh, my colleagues at dlr and other people and there's uh, who give you exactly four different steps of um research software uh, types like suggestions what you could uh, improve regarding software engineering of your project and stuff like that and um to come a little bit back to the question it's like um, often you don't have an RSE where you can say, here, take this, do this for me. You don't have the structure in a lot of research institutes. Um, it's about financing, it's about organization, about having those people, but often there's somebody who's at least interested in it. And so you have to find the right persons who then you then perhaps contact at the right time and say, okay, I'm now at a certain point of my project and I perhaps need your help. And so it's important to identify the right people also who can help you with this in your uh, in your institute and that's why it's so important to have a community there um, so you know who can support you and that it's not only always one single person who has to help everybody. Thank you. Uh, Kim, you have something you want to add? Yeah, uh, I would like for me to, to, to illustrate with an example why I consider that it's really, I would say, even mandatory to have this combination of, of research scientists and, and scientists. I'm, I'm, I'm in the uh, High performance computing wall. So we are operating with uh, with machines. Uh, in our case, Mare Nostrum, but many other machines. And as you may know, these are really complex machines. So using these machines uh, with with a combination of of hardware and software is really complex. And and if we don't team together the scientist that knows, for example, is the one that developed the model, and a research scientist that that really has a knowledge, for example, on HPC. This will never work, and I will, would be even farther. And, and at, at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, that we have even a, compu a, a computer science department, we realize that if you try to make a speech a modeler that knows, for example, the, the methodological model, and you take a, a computer science engineer that really knows only about the hardware, there is a very big gap between them. In, in to close this gap, you even need, for example, people research software for of my team, which are have the the yeah, are specialized in and in our case in computational air science that will cover this this gap and will make this this interaction much more easy. Because if you tell if you if you try to 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 overcome it, it will be really difficult, and then you have problems that the model does not run, you don't take enough performance, and and so on. And, find, and, and my last statement is something that we put a lot of, of effort. You were mentioning, for example, in proposals to put research engineers, because we, we really understand that there, there are always a need of working in models, not only in development of new features, but for example, analyzing the performance, how it, if you can 
take much more advantage of a model in a machine because at the end, if you run it better, you will you will be able to run much more experiments and produce at the end what we I think much more better science. So that's why I consider that it's a, it's needed and a, and a teamwork between both both groups. Okay, so and then back to Patrick, and then we'll go to Rolf to, to end this topic and move to the next one. Yeah, so just a, a quick follow up that addresses a few of the points that were just raised. Um, so I think that, yeah, we have so much, we have such a limited amount of time as scientists and as engineers working uh, on things funded for science um, that we have to be very efficient with our time. And I think one way that's quite simple that addresses a lot of these problems is being very good at producing things like memo working examples, like readmes, like mini apps, which can be really the same thing. This means that if you're embarrassed about your code or you're worried it's not user friendly, um, get very good at presenting uh, a concrete set of instructions on how to get the code to go from nothing to producing an image or a small understandable output to a domain scientist um, of how it works. Um, I think this is important uh, on many of these levels we've talked about. So it frees you from a lot of the burden of having to document everything, of having to worry about the internals of your code being overly criticized because it really points people directly to the one thing that you guarantee should work. It answers the question of what does this code do? How do I run it? If I'm trying to optimize it for an HPC context, what is the first thing that I optimize? Um, so I think that I'd like to hear yeah, suggestions from the, from the community and from all of you as well on ways that almost sound trivial like this, but ways that you can really focus your effort um, into saving time and energy um, that have worked. And I found that like, pr providing things like simple readmes and quick starts to users is very little work for me. It's useful to me if I go back to projects. Um, and I think it's a good, a good thing to emphasize as we're training people on using software is how to produce minimal examples um, and quick starts. Okay, Ralph, back to you. Um, one of the things that Suzanne said is that she likes to see that community not be separated. And I agree to a point where I actually think it's not domain scientists over here and research over engineers over there, and then a big nothing in between. There, there's a spectrum and it depends on your personal preferences as well as the, the field you're in, uh, where on that spectrum you uh, you fall. But if you look, if you're more towards the domain scientist part of that spectrum, um, you're incentivized to show it the first time. And um, as Patrick addressed, um, that first time it will probably not be so nice. And I, I like to make a parallel to the uh, hardware development uh, section of, of uh, uh, earth sciences, sensor design, etc., where I'm also a big part of, that actually embraces the, this is really rough, you know, this is really rough. And we're, we're happy that it's, so, but it just works the first time, usually 80% of the time. And we present it in things like the MacGyver session, it has a ton of duct tape on it. But the problem is, as soon as someone else wants to use this, because it is very useful, as soon as someone else wants to use it, they don't want to have that rough version. And what we're lacking, I think, is the incentive to improve upon this one. Because I've written, I can write a paper about this one, but I can't write a second paper that says, I just made it slightly better. Um, and so we need to have something in place to be able to do that, because only then can people build on each other's work. Great, thank you. Um, so let's let's go on to a, a different question. This is um, maybe the one that came in from uh, Colin, which is um, should code used to produce a scientific paper be tested, replicated as part of peer review? And if so, by whom? Uh, Suzanne? Yeah, we just I started answering in the, in the Q and A. Um, I, I think that's a really interesting point. Um, and and uh, as, as I wrote in, in, in the q and I mean, I've came across a, a case where um, um, a publisher not only asked for the software to, to be made available, but they actually wanted the reviewer to, to check the models, which I think is, is great. You know? But at the same time, it poses a very practical problem because some, some of my models, they run for months. You know? And not everybody might be willing to <laughs> postpone the review process or to, to extend it for months. And some reviewers might not just have the facility to actually in the time um, to, to run the models. So, so maybe we should think of another way in which we could um, 
as, as a community come up with ways to, to check what we do. I mean, often when I start a new study, I actually start by reproducing what somebody has published. And we also do, do benchmarks where we all pull together and, and run the, the same complicated nonlinear science problem where we don't know the answer to. And, but yeah, so I think it's an interesting point, but um, how to do it practically is, is another, another thing here. Okay, thank you. Um, Patrick. Um, so just a quick response to that that I've seen in reviewing things for the HPC community is that you often have the same problem that you can't reproduce something because you don't have access to the particular supercomputer they used, but uh, there are partial solutions to this and one of them, so there's a great paper by Torsten Hoffler where he proposes this idea of interpretability of results and it's not that you can necessarily reproduce them, but it's that you can understand enough to reproduce the, the actual idea that's being presented. And then another thing that I really appreciated from another paper I reviewed is that they provided a fairly good um, set of, of scripts and output logs from their HPC runs. I don't have access to this computer, but it allowed me to apply my most of what I would do as a reviewer, which is read the paper, think of things that seem suspicious, and then verify that those suspicions are either justified or not by looking in the actual logs. I could see how they launched their jobs. I could, I could get a lot of the way to reviewing this even without access to the computer. There's still some aspect of trust that's never going to go away in reviewing scientific work, but I think we need to at least create some standards of um, ethics in providing enough data that the motivated reviewer can answer some of their questions at least. I think that will get us most of the way. Yeah, I think related to that, there's been some work um, from David Sorgel about confirmation depth, which I think is, is fairly similar in concept. Um, let's see, Rolf. Um, I like that uh, Patrick mentioned the, the level of trust. I mean, um, we trusted Newton when he wrote like the numbers of his measurement on a notepad. So th there's always like a turtles all the way down uh, thing that, that we'll have to accept. But given that, um, if what, what Suzanne said, some of her models run for months, um, what you usually see in most research is, is that you can compartmentalize uh, your research phases with your model runs producing some output and then some analysis on the output. And usually if you can provide that output data to a reviewer so that they can, they can make different um, graphs based on, uh, on that output data, they can get a feeling that you're not cherry picking, you're not just making this one graph that looks really good uh, based on that output. And that would maybe uh, imply giving your reviewers actual um, access to whatever machine is hosting that output data. Um, so that would be a technical hurdle um, for a paper that we're writing. We're actually providing in the letter to the editor, we're providing logins to our machine so that the reviewers can work on this machine and, and do a few analysis to see that we're not fooling around. Okay, and Kim. Yeah, to follow to, uh, on, on, on this point, I mean the I think in the same field as Susan that says that we cannot in in climate, for example, we cannot reproduce a, a simulation that can take. For me, I would say that even a, a, an optimistic, I would be I would be happy if, for example, we are able to to reproduce a result even inside the same institution. So after some year, if if I take even as Raul said the the outputs, and I'm able to to take these outputs and do the analysis and get some results. And, and this is sometimes it's really, really difficult because you don't have already access to the machine where you put the, the where you did the results or you cannot reproduce the, the, the software stack, the tools that led to these, these results. So for this, I think we need to put a lot of, of effort in, in understanding how is the, our infrastructure and, and trying to be to, 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 to put tools that are, are allow us to, to have a clear picture on how was the system what, when, when we did this, this analysis to be able to reproduce. And for this, we have alternatives like SPAC, EasyBuild that, that will automate the, the, the deployment of software. And at least you say, okay, I did this, this analysis and I know how my, my system was at that time. And I, it will help you. And, it will not always guarantee that you will get the same the same results. Great. So there were um, there were a couple of 
comments or I don't know, either questions or comments. It seems like uh, people are using the question and answer to put in some comments as well as to ask questions, which is probably okay. Uh, looking at journals and talking about the role of journals in this process, and in particular, um, the fact that there are journals where software can be reviewed. Um, however, this is different than actually reviewing how the software is used in a particular science case. And so I'm curious if any uh, panelists want to talk about what they think the role of um, of journals that just look at software kind of in, in general and in the absence of a particular science case um, is in terms of reproducibility in, in this work. And Rolf is concerned. Why do we even have journals? So um, basically, if we want to acknowledge people's contribution in software, the only reason we're writing a article in, in a 200 year old format is because we want to have academic credit for it. It, it. Just put it on something that has a DOI, make sure it's cited nicely, make sure it's documented nicely. Um, but the journal, sorry, you ha I, I know you started the Journal of Open Source Software and I feel that in the current system, we need it because otherwise people that are uh, contributing software, which is an immensely important part to the scientific endeavor, are not recognized. But I think we should face it out and find another way to recognize people for this without having them to go jump the hoops um, uh, on, on writing these articles, what they could have done in, in a nice repo that has the same info. All right, so um, just to respond to that very quickly and then we'll, we'll go on to Karina. Um, so I'm one of the co-founders of JOS. I'm not the founder. Um, so I just want to point that out there. Uh, Arfin Smith is, is really the main founder. Um, but also the papers are on the order of one to two pages. So they're not um, too, too difficult to write. The review is mostly of the software. And then finally, um, our goal for the journal is to have the journal go away. We don't actually want it to stick around. We want people to cite software directly. Um, it's really just a temporary activity because the, over the scholarly system doesn't work very well for citing software directly right now. And so it's a, it's a placeholder for the minute. Um, sorry, so uh, Karina. Sorry, uh, Danny, I, I just wanted to jump to your rescue and say exactly what you thought, because I think currently it's really something we need um, with the current system. And people are about to change this kind of system, or trying to. It's, it's an effort a lot of people put in to change it. Um, there's a lot of work in the field of software citations um, who try to, to find their solutions, because it's not as easier to sometimes might uh, expect like okay you can cite software in a way but it's about dependencies who get some which which kind of part of the fame goes to whom uh, and stuff like this so it's not as easy as it might seem at first glance and second i think we also need some a way to kind of um still like give a meaning to to a, a piece of software meaning um or give it have the possibility to say something about the quality so currently um um, in, I think it just, but uh, um, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but also I know from other uh, conferences, the software is at least looked at is, can somebody run it? Can somebody understand what it's about? Can they kind of give a good argument why this is important for science? And it's not just any piece of software, but it's kind of has an, it's, it has an influence because I mean, we want to in a bit half uh, measures this in a, in a way that this is important for science. I mean, we could even open it up and say this is important for everybody somehow, um, but perhaps we go step by step. And so it's important that we have some criteria to judge this piece of software, because um, if not, you have a, a criteria which you can undermine really quickly. And I mean, judging the quality of software is something a lot of people have been dealing with uh, a long time and all these things like who's contributing her match lines of code it's all like ideas which are already known to, to be bad because you can 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 really screw this up and like okay i made a million lines uh commits so you now um i get a lot of fame and i did so much but in reality this is not the case so there's a lot of things we have to to um target and i think it's a step-by-step -step process and uh things like just is a great step on the way in the right direction um but um, this is really ad ad adaptation how research works is not necessarily like how people are, yeah, you could say radar, like, yeah, how many, not, not just by papers, but give it, like move them to something which is similar first and then go to completely new new ways. But it's, it's something which is in the process, I think, yeah. 
uh, we need to do there a lot and do a lot of research in this field. And I know there's quite some groups working on exactly all of these topics. So it's not my ideas, it's something um, a lot of people also some here in this round um, are working on. So yeah. Great, thank you. So uh, Patrick, for the last answer to this immediate topic, then we'll go. Uh, to yeah, I won't reiterate the same point, but I'll just make a, a slight defense that sometimes sometimes we don't need a paper for a piece of software to be citable. So I'm glad that it's possible, but sometimes I do like reading that. Like I can, I'm an academic and sometimes it's really illuminating to hear an expert be forced to summarize their work and present it. Um, and a paper is one way to do that. So I think that that should still be a venue that exists, um, but not everything needs to be published in, in TOMS, for example. But I would like researchers to still have that opportunity because I think that I have certainly learned a lot from some papers on software, if perhaps not most. Okay, great. So we will, um, at this point, we'll run a second poll. Um, we've been talking a bit about problems. Um, this poll will be a little bit about agreement on these problems and a little bit about solutions. And then we'll try to, to focus the remaining part of the session more on solutions. Okay, good. Um, so I think this will be interesting because I was realizing as I was answering these questions that there were a lot of them that I wanted to answer in one way, but I couldn't quite answer them the way I wanted because the wording was a little bit too strict. Um, so I'm curious to see what other people thought as well. So we see that uh, there's pretty strong support for mandatory initial training in software. Um, there's pretty strong support for all software being open, even nuclear reactor software. Uh, kind of mixed views on journals requiring sharing of the software being used in research, which is interesting because if the software is open in the previous question, but it doesn't have to be shared, I'm not quite sure how those get balanced. Um, but at least everybody or almost everybody seems to think it should be cited, which is one where I actually said no, because I think there's probably software that doesn't need to be cited, like LaTeX, for example. Um, so it's interesting to see how people interpret this question. Uh, lots of people think funders should require publishing software. Interesting question answers about who's responsible for making sure the software is used and uh, lots of support for EGU offering a second abstract for, for different uh, kinds of objects. Um, so, uh, so let's actually just start with these and maybe I'll just ask the panelists uh, if we can keep these uh, questions up as well. If anybody wants to kind of respond to any part of this and we'll start with Kim. Yeah, thank you. I will, I will jump on the first question on the initial training. So yeah, I, I, I did not really understand or, or it's the, 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 the mandatory, the, if it's mandatory in each institution, but I think for, for, for research software, when, when they work, obviously it's mandatory to start continuing developing. But for me, I would, I would, I would more focus on if it's mandatory for scientists that enter and need and learn how to use the, the tools that are produced in the same place or, re, or reused by, by other scientists, by, by, other, by other teams. And then uh, for me, uh, uh, um, a community that is quite important in these things, it's the PhDs. So how the PhDs enters and they, they handle off this software when they had a, a, at the beginning, in the first year, that, that they have lots of for for them, everything is new. They have the pre the pressure of of starting the, the research, and then they have to learn in all a, a bunch of new software that probably they they don't know. So this is really 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 difficult, and and we need to put a lot of efforts. And this comes from the management, from the tutors, to to really devote some time to do this training and and to handle because I think they the the there will have an impact on the on their careers. Okay, thank you, Patrick. This is just a brief, uh, brief follow up on, on Dr. Katz's comment. Um, I also had the same problem answering those questions and that most of them, I would say 99% of the time make everything open. So I think that there's no replacement for uh, a community that understands the ethical reasons for doing these things. If the community at large understands and believes that Open, open source software, sharing of information, reproducibility is actually what drives science, then these things kind of become obvious and those norms can be created. Um, absolute rules like make every piece of software open source are impractical in many cases. There's, uh, people won't accept that. I think anyone in the, in the audience can think of a practical reason that they wouldn't be able to do that in every single case, but we can and still should enforce um, ethical norms in our communities that say that 
reproducibility and openness um, and some sense of, of um, giving this even of your, of your results is, is important. Okay, uh, Rolf? I wanna, mm, I don't like to force all PhDs to follow one particular course because of the enorm diversity that we have within the geosciences on topics that people have. We have we have PhDs that do most of their work in the water lab. They do very sophisticated uh, measurements. They do their um, analysis mainly uh, in analytical equations and then uh, could do the entire uh, data analysis in Excel. Ha maybe have an open source version of Excel. These don't necessarily have to use a, if they don't have to follow a software design course um, I am a very strong proponent of having like a multitude of courses that incoming PhDs together with the supervisor can uh, select from that are suited to whatever research they are going to do. But I don't like the, the blend, everybody needs to know this uh, statements. All right, uh, Karina. You're muted. Sorry, it had to happen once to one. So it's just time with me. Um, I kind of agree and I disagree. So on the one hand, um, I agree that there's not this one course everybody has to take and this will help everybody. That's definitely not the case. Um, but we started offering some really basic courses which we offer and we recommend to a lot of people. And um, greatly, there's not just the trainings we give at our um, research center, but Helmholtz White with the German um, um, collection of research centers, you could say. And we are, uh, have a great project where we start sharing our trainings, meaning we have um, always like some introduction into how to use Git and how to do a little bit of data analysis using, for example, Jupyter Notebooks or Python or something. So we have there like different nuances of kind of a similar basic thing. So all learn some great basics because nearly everywhere GitLab or Git is used in a way. So they got some, some basic knowledge, but they can uh, see what fits them best, which ones that fits them best. And it's not just offered by us, but by a lot of different centers. So they can pick one and they have it close to the beginning when they start with us. And it doesn't matter if it's PhDs or people just coming to us and they start to have anything to do with development. Obviously, if somebody is just building stuff or something, they might not have to um, attend the training or it's it's never forced but in my opinion you always should as a when somebody starts working from you always think about what do they need to, to do with me what will be their task and which trainings would be helpful for them and then I send them along really early and I show them where they are and so for me it got like a requirement to at least think about if they should go to this this and this kind of trainings and some are really the basics like git or gitlab use and there we also not only show like okay this is how do you do a big software project but this is how do you do when you have a small script or even if you want to organize yourself and some documents or you can write papers in it and so we show the whole range so people can get used to tools which they then can use in software development as well and for example we do a training regarding sustainable software development which is focusing on software but it's not like uh, software design but it's a bit about clean code how can you have a nice structure which should be in a repository which belongs together a little bit about open source licenses so that they know when they use dependencies from others where they have to take care and where they have to be careful if it's gpl code or something and stuff so we try to give them a nice overview in two half days to uh, those that they feel familiar now where the tricky part is and especially who to contact and who they can ask within DLR or within Helmholtz. And I think this is the way you need to go. You don't need to make some experts, definitely not, um, because not everybody of them becomes a uh, research software engineer or really a scientific developer or however you want to call them. But if they have some basic knowledge and know where the tricky parts are and where they have to become careful, uh, this can prevent a lot of things because um, we do a lot of consultation. Um, I do a lot of open source software and license consultations and also with and architecture and so on and so on, continuous integration, software engineering. People come to me with stuff and I so often it's like, okay, if you would have done this small thing in the beginning a little bit 
better or if you have knew about this and that basic concepts you might have taken another path and you wouldn't now sit there with kind of a mess of software which nobody wants to use but everybody has to and it's kind of got important and they have to rewrite or how can we go with this and you don't have this this broken piece of legacy code which you need to deal with but um so i think it's all while these questions are very strong like everybody and everywhere i i went with yes because i say okay at least think about going to this but um yeah it's it's important that we go in the right direction there great thank you um so we'll let's see i think uh, suzanne wants to talk about a different one of the poll questions i believe please go ahead yeah so that that was num number six the um who's responsible for making sure science software used in a publication is of sufficient quality i find it, it, it's um, it's an intriguing question we, we addressed it partly right um, and then we talked about the review process um and and um, your journal of, of open software that, that should be phased out because we should find other ways of of acknowledging and, and citing the, the the software but um so in, in my field in geodynamics, publishing a software by itself is, is a really hard go. So, so a journal will require that you, you, you publish your software in the sense that you, you put it in a paper where you actually use it for an application and they will review the application and, and, and not the software. So if we, we ask them who's, who's going to make sure that that software is actually of reasonable quality, I would agree with, with most people in the positive. First of all, the researcher, you need to document this. You, know? you need to show that you've passed the standard tests and benchmarks in, in, in your field, for example. But the, the interesting one for, for me is like the journal. Because being editor of a journal, I, I, could, I, could, I would say you know, the poor editors you know, that, that would have to handle this. And, and they, would, they would, of course, do is to ask a reviewer to, to do it, which brings us back to, to the, the earlier a debate a discussion that we had on how, how do reviewers do this you know? and, and can you ask them to to it's not always possible as, as Rolf said earlier to co compartmentalize a software and just ask them to look at a specific part or, or the data set i mean the, da the the data that your software puts out at the end you can always give but but it's been through so many steps already you know that that, that step is probably not not the best one to look at then you're looking more at the visualization, but it's all the steps in between, in, in, in especially when you have nonlinear feedbacks that make it not intuitive to, to understand what, what happens. So I think, yeah, I would say it's first of all our responsibility the, 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 as, as, as a researcher, um, whether I use my own software or somebody else's software, I need to document that, that it is behaving well and it's of sufficient quality. Okay, uh, Ralph, comment? Yeah, I think that um, if, if you disregard the very high end of the HPC uh, part of the community at the moment, the, the, the model runs that take forever and ever, um, I would argue that we can demand from the editorial staff, not the editors themselves, because they're unpaid labor as well, I mean, what are we paying journals for anyway? So why not demand that the editorial staff at least does a first check on, if I run this code, does it generate the same graph as the author is claiming? Um, and to, to some degree, that, that process could be automated. Uh, and for some research, uh, especially if I look at my own field in hydrology, for a lot of research, I think you could provide a single notebook um, with some containers around it, where you could say, if you run this on your hardware, it should generate this graph as well. And it starts at this, that point with what we consider input files. Um, and I think that that is something that publishers could be asked to do before it goes to reviewers who then can vouch on the scientific quality of, uh, of the work being done. Yeah, so it's interesting. I think I, I didn't read this as, um, is necessarily scientific quality. I was reading this more as software quality, so it's uh, interesting to see. I, I I understand, but I would say that the the software quality is the, well. Of course, the quality of the work in itself is, of course, with the one producing it, both the scientific and the software quality. Um, but then checking the software quality could be done at the pub. At least for a first level check, could be done at. 
the publishers, the amount of review requests you get where just one glance through it, you would say this, this should have been stopped by the editorial staff before it reached reviewers. Um, so that's why I say involve them more. Yeah, I, it's, uh, it, this brings up a question about if there's a difference between um, something being reproducible or reusable and something having high quality, um, which I think there probably is, but I'm not completely sure. Uh, but Patrick, you're, you have something you wanted to add. Yeah, I mean, I guess on that point, I would say that the when it comes down to allocating your limited time, if it's a paper that's supposed to make a research contribution, it would be nice if it was high quality software, but it has to be reproducible. Um, but to follow up on something Ralph said, I think that in terms of basic tools that we need to educate people about, I personally wish I knew more about, about containerization because that is a solution that is becoming more popular in the software world at large for making things reproducible in terms of testing and um, deployment and so on. Um, I think this also ties in with uh, why using open source tools is good for science in the sense that I've found that those tend to be more scriptable. They have less of an incentive to really uh, keep you contained in any kind of ecosystem. So for instance, something like Paraview, which I think a lot of us in geodynamics use, is becoming increasingly scriptable. And as an open source project, I'm really glad to see that because maybe we're not there yet, but I think in a few years, it should be totally reasonable to say, you know, use this, use this Linux image, download this version of Paraview, run this Python script. It might be a horrible looking script, but it'll generate the picture. And if and when I need to go in there and interrogate that as a reviewer who might be also an expert in pair review, it becomes possible to apply the scientific process at least. Like there might still be some ugliness because we don't have time to do everything nicely, but the fundamental thing can still be preserved if we use these tools and educate people on the basics of how to run scripts, use containers, those types of things. So since we've been uh, since we've been talking about openness a fair bit, I'd like to talk about platforms briefly and see what people um, think about that. Uh, and so I'm, I'm kind of curious if uh, from the panelists if they have particular platforms that they think are good for um, for sharing software, for using software, for reproducibility. And part of the reason that I ask this is that there have been um, ties between some journals and some uh, closed commercial packages as as platforms and. And then there also are more open platforms. And I'm, I'm curious if anybody thinks that the, whether the platform is open or closed actually matters in terms of what we should be using and, and what platforms people think are, are the best ones to use today, uh, again, for, for sharing, uh, for reproducibility, and for reuse. So Kim? If you want. Hey, I will start for sharing, for example, something that we that at the beginning when we when we started, I think six six years back at, at in the Earth science department with the arrival of a new director. For sharing, we had a, a debate, for example, if to use GitHub that at this at, the, at this time was already was pushing, or 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 directly go for an instance of a property uh, a known instance of GitLab. So we were thinking on 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 both ideas on, on both and finally we we decided the the to take the the own GitLab because you can the, the code is in your place and you have more control and then you can share but that's true that if, if with the years we we detected that that not being for example in a platform like github sometimes it's much more difficult than to share and collaborate the code so this is something that we were not thinking at the beginning because when you have to give access and you have to give users, so so now we have the code in our places, and and I think it's good. But in the other in the other hand, if we compare that now, lots of institutions are moving to GitHub. I think we lost we are losing uh, easiness to to share and and interact with other users that can fork and so on your your research software. Okay, um, Rolf, did you want to respond? Um, I want to make sure that we don't present this as a false dilemma because I think you can do both. Um, so, so you can have your code on GitHub um, because it's easy to use and you like to develop on GitHub with your team and make use of all the fancy bells and whistles that are available there and also use it to share with people, but you're scared that Microsoft at some point might pull the plug, etc. cetera. Um, you can have a mirror on your own uh, GitLab or uh, have releases on Zenodo that make sure that the archiving function uh, is maintained. 
uh, I completely agree with Kim that usability of a platform should be very important in making the decision where you work, but you can have uh, double instances and are synced copies of whatever you want uh, in my view. I guess uh, I, I'm also kind of curious about things that are more for code that's usable, like things that for, for code that's in a container or things like Code Ocean or Binder or, or, or these kind of other platforms as well. But uh, Karina, did you want to add something before we? Um, I just wanted to add that we are exactly at this point. So we have our internal GitLab, but we have still quite some code on GitHub. We use the mirrors. It has some disadvantages because you still have one place where you develop, where you have your issues and so on. Um, you can move stuff around, um, but our main problem is that people know internally now our GitLab, so they know how to handle it, how to use it, and GitHub is different. So currently we are thinking about changing to GitLab for stuff so that they have to just deal with one tool, but obviously it's not the main used framework. So while it's not a, um, it, it doesn't have to be uh, one or the other, doing both ways is also kind of a struggle and you need a strategy and we're currently working on that. So um, just wanted to, to mention this a little bit from my practical side where I'm currently standing at. Okay, Kim. Uh, yeah, that, that has been, this technology has been mentioned in the last minutes, it, it's containerization. So from the HPC side, this is something that I think I, at the beginning when when we when we got this 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 new idea this new promise when we reached the HPC centers the idea should be that it it would change the game and it would be things more easier but I'm sorry and after some years working it you realize that perhaps it's it has good good points but it's not the the solution that will that we like the ring gather everything so in when you arrive in an HPC, depending of the policy of sysadmins, for example, there are there are tools that are not there are solutions that are not allowed like Docker, then they want you to use other 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 solutions. So it can be it can be used for for some special use cases, but it will not clear and would not solve everything. So and and I think this this is part of what we were saying that to have research uh, engineers that will help and will will allow to identify which use cases will are suitable to be to be solved and and uh, using this kind of of technology as as containers okay great um so because we're actually getting close to the end of the session time um, I'd like to start moving towards the end. And what we were planning to do is to have closing statements from each of the panelists, again, maybe a minute or two. Um, and the, the, this can be general, but also kind of interested in what you have learned from this from the session and what maybe what you're thinking about slightly differently or what you're thinking are, are interesting challenges that you weren't thinking about before. Um, and we'll go ahead and do this in the same order, I think, that we did the, the previous part and start with Karina. Wait, so no, I don't have time to think about that. <laughs> um, yeah, after that, I uh, really like the um, results of the polls um, to see that um, so many are for this open and um, community uh, going way. Um, I took with me, um, especially the arguments from, from Rolf, um, who's kind of staying on another type, aside for some things, um, um, but he, he is correct, especially with um, that we need a, a structured role for, for this big software project where you can't perhaps run this really well just with um, scientists because they should focus and they're on their science. Um, while I still stick with all the other parts um, where scientists are definitely necessary. And also for some projects, they have to stay in the loop really close because I don't want to deal with the domain knowledge and to, to get all of this into my head they have. So they should do this part and I'm dealing with the rest. Um, so yeah, this was, was really interesting. And uh, I would have loved to hear, uh, hear more about the contentization and stuff because there's something um, also still up as a challenge. So if there's something really practical, hit me up with it. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kim is next. So 
for me, the, the main the main takeaway of of this debate is the that we had time and the organizing uh, thought on this topic of research engineers to 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 have this debate in a, such a forum like EGU. So my I'm a research engineer, and and when I when I started for me, EGU was the place of of where scientists of uh, geophysical scientists were were presenting their work and. And realizing that right now we have time to to discuss these kind of things, really, I think we are in in the good way. It's in places like this where where we will discuss these these topics. People that perhaps are not so used and don't have these ideas will take something and will say, okay, so we can apply this this at least this piece of of ideas. I can take it back and try to see. Could I implement a GitLab or should I ask for these services in my institution? And I think bit to bit, we will realize that, that if we apply these practices, we will go a step further and we will deploy it in much more centers at the very end and, and, and goal of, of developing much more better software for research sciences. So thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Patrick. Yeah, so thank you all so much. This has been really, really interesting. So I think one thing that's emerged for me over and over is that there's really no way around um, emphasizing the community aspect of these things. We tend to think of these as being purely technical issues, but so many of the problems we have are really about communication. So I think that we need to make sure that we have a continuing dedication to a common set of values about what we're trying to do, but also I would argue some basic technical literacy that allows us to work together. This isn't about making software, making researchers do the jobs of software engineers. But I think that understanding, having some common language about how computer software works, especially lower level things, um, how to use terminals, um, how to write scripts, for example, is, is essential for us to be able to talk to each other and foment these, uh, these community relationships that are gonna solve a lot of our problems. Um, and since we didn't talk about it very much, but I think in terms of how to get these things funded, I think that, um, a good knock-on effect of requiring more openness from publications, from review processes, um, and particularly from grants is that RICs are gonna have to be written into grants to provide the reporting, to provide the things that are required for these publications. So I think we should very much support those sorts of rules because it really means that um, if those things are first-class deliverables, they have to be uh, produced by first-class staff, basically. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Rolf. Yeah. Um, first, thank you, of course, for inviting me to, to be here as a panelist. I really enjoyed it. Um, and thank you for organizing this. It was a really smoothly run session. I have three final points that I want to address. The first is rather technical. Um, I'm in hydrology, a field where every research group has its own model. And um, it's virtually impossible to run on someone else's model because legacy code, different system, dependencies, etc. We're building the system based on containerization that does allow you to work with each other's model and work through interfaces. Um, so please hook up with me uh, or any of the people on the eWater Cycle team during EGU. We'd love to talk uh, about what we've developed. There's an upcoming technical paper where we're describing this system, uh, but it's upcoming and I'm not push it, putting a date on it right now because some of my team members are watching and like, no, 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 <laughs> don't mention dates, uh, uh, rightly so. Um, the second thing that I want to mention is uh, what I heard a little bit today is uh, people saying researchers should do this and research software engineers should do that. And I think we should be very careful by making statements like that. We should always ask ourselves if they should, why aren't they doing it yet? Um, what is stopping them from actually doing that? Because because a lot of these things are obvious. PhD should learn how better how to better write code. Why aren't they doing it yet? Because either nobody's telling them or they're too busy or they're just focusing on writing papers and they don't have to write incentives. So we should also address that part of academic structure and culture if we wanna make the change. Um, and finally, talking about that culture, um, I think that uh, there were some questions in the chat about what can early career scientists do? Culture change is hard. Um, and I think that the senior scientists listening in on this should take the responsibility to push for that culture change. At the same time, um, shortly, there's going to be an opinion paper out. Um, Caitlin Hall is the lead author on that. It will be on Earth Archive as a preprint very soon. That 
provides a how-to guide, practical guide on how to be an open hydrologist. And it will also have very relevant stuff for how to uh, share software. So I'd like to advertise that here. Um, that's all. Thanks, everyone. All right, and Suzanne. So, so I, I started off by, um, by, by saying in the beginning that there's this fine balance between what, what we really wish and, and what we actually manage. And uh, I think I'm coming out of the debate with thinking uh, that, that question is kind of still there. Um, what, what was interesting for me was uh, what was brought up concerning the, the role of, of, of journals and, and their responsibility, it, which is true in a way because the, the journals are, of course, finally responsible for what they put out. Um, but there's only so much that you can actually um, put on them, and, it, and it's indeed not the, the, the editors, because editors are also volunteers. And the question is, if you put it on the staff of the publisher, what does that mean for, for the cost? Because mm -hmm. somewhere along the line, somebody has to, to, to pay. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, the other thing that, yeah, there's clearly a need for, for communication between those who develop software, those who use the software, the, the, the journals, the um, people who train the, the, you know, the, the different generations um, that, that are using the different generations of software, <laughs> because it's like the, the legacy software um, that, that can be um, sometimes very interesting to, to access and to, and to read. Um, so one thing I was all thinking, we didn't talk much about the funders, but I think actually grants should be written um, in, in a way that, they, um, that they're, they're, there's time written in. For, docu for publishing a software, for documenting it and for making it available. The same as we now started writing in costs for open access publishing, we should write in the costs for any software that's developed during the grant time to make that software available. Um, and it should not be assumed that, that this just happens by itself. So, so I, lo I love the attention for the, for the research software. So thanks a lot to, to the organizers and thanks a lot to my colleagues on, on the panel. Hey, great, thank you. Um, I I guess I just want to, to throw in one comment based on what folks have said, um, which is that uh, the early career folks uh, who are listening, um, who have different ideas, um, it's important to remember those ideas when you become more senior and not to feel beaten down by the system that you've managed to succeed in, but uh, to remember that, that there are ways that we could change it to make it easier. Um, so with that, I want to uh, thank the panelists and the uh, conveners for, uh, for the panelists for bringing up great topics and making this a great discussion, the conveners for making this very easy. Um, I want to apologize slightly to the people who have asked questions that we haven't gotten to. Um, I, I wish we would have had uh, probably twice as much time because we actually had some of our own questions as well. And, uh, and there were a number of things that I was looking forward to hearing the debate about, but we'll have to have to wait and come back for the next time. Um, and so with this, I'll turn it over to the conveners to, to wrap up. Thank you, Dan, and thanks everybody for, for such a lively debate. I found it very interesting. And uh, for everybody who wants to follow up on the poll results, um, I've copied them over to the slide deck, which I which is shared um, by the link uh, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, and I also found uh, this very interesting. I think we were only partly preaching to the choir, so it was great to see that the vast majority of people do recognize software, for example, and uh, that many, uh, quite quite a few people already share, always always share their software. And um, I found it also interesting to see um, that there's, uh, on some points, quite quite high agreement on things that we might change in the future. And on that note, I really uh, enjoyed um, the debate and the closing statements. And I've tried to capture a few of these thoughts that, that resonated with me uh, during the debate. Um, and I've, I've put them in the slide. And I think I only want to um, look at the, the last ideas that were shared, uh, that culture change is hard. And um, every, we need to work together to, to drive it. Uh, and it's, uh, it's hard because all aspects of science are touched upon. And uh, that's why I'm very, very uh, grateful to the speakers uh, that they participated today, because I hope this event uh, was uh, one of the building blocks for us to uh, discuss what we need to change and how we can uh, improve research software in the geosciences and, and uh, improve the situation for all people uh, developing and using uh, that research software. Um, that said, 
thank you very much for your participation. Um, don't forget to uh, um, stop by the data help desk on Twitter. And uh, also feel free to use um, the link at the bottom of this page, bit.ly slash VEGU minus software minus discuss. It will lead you to a, a discussion forum on GitHub where you are invited to follow up with each other or with, uh, uh, with panelists and uh, share your own ideas and ask the questions that we were not able to discuss today. Thank you. And I wish you all uh, a great uh, remaining uh, days and events at the EGU this year and hope to see you all again next year in Vienna.